Well, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. I had been looking forward to uh, speaking to all of you in person, and so I'm going to have to get used to speaking to a camera again, though we have a couple people here. And uh, I'm going to ask everyone to turn into their Bibles to the book of Philippians. We're going to be reading from it in just a few moments. The book of Philippians is the theme book for Yosemite Bible Camp this year, and I still plan on going up there. Uh, hopefully that'll still work out, but I, I plan to go up there. And so I was getting ready and I was reading through the book of Philippians and I got to a certain passage and it just hurt me. And you might say, what do you mean it hurts you? Uh, well, what I'm talking about is a one, two punch by the Holy spirit. Okay. A one, two punch of conviction where, uh, you know, James called the, the Bible a uh, mirror and the Bible was certainly a mirror to me this week where it held up my own reflection and uh, I got to see all my flaws and all my blemishes. And so in many ways, this sermon is a confession. It's not one of those lessons where I, it is, excuse me, one of those lessons where I'm preaching to myself more than anyone else. Hopefully it benefits uh, those who might be struggling with the same issue as me. But I, I, again, I'd just like to warn you up front that I'm going to be stomping really hard on my own toes, but only because the Holy Spirit did it first. So let's have a prayer at this time. Dear Father, Lord God in heaven, Lord, please bathe us in your spirit. Lord, transform us into the people you want us to be. Lord, please guide us in our study of your word. And Lord, please be gentle as you show us our faults. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to illustrate what I'm talking about this morning, I did bring, a, uh, I did bring something here with me. It's an apron. Hopefully you can see it. And I'm going to go ahead and put this on. I'm going to do my best not to make a horrible noise on the microphone. All right, here we go. I got this apron in college. We had a chili bowl. You might be able to read that. It says chili bowl, Fried Hardman University. Uh, we got like fourth or fifth place, my team. And uh, sadly, my chili making skills have not translated to our chili bowl here. I, uh, I guess the competition is just too fierce. Uh, but <clears throat> when I won this, I was very proud and I thought, you know, what? I'm going to wear it every time that I cook. I'm going to pull it out every time I, I want to do a cookout or something like that. Well, you'll notice this apron is pretty clean, isn't it? In fact, some might call it immaculate. It's very clean, especially for an apron that I've had pretty much my entire adult life. But aprons aren't supposed to be clean, are they? Aprons are supposed to be covered in grime. These are, are made to, to, to catch all the grease and all the the muck and all the sweat. That's what aprons are for. So what does it tell you about myself that this apron is clean? Well, it tells you I don't wear this apron very often. Oh, I'll pull it out on special occasions. I'll pull it out if I want to grill a steak or something like that. But I'm not the person in the house who cooks every meal. I'm not the person in the house who does the dishes. I'm not the person you're going to find and Honestly, I don't think you'll find Carissa doing this, but this is just an example. I'm not the person you're going to find on my hands and knees in the kitchen scrubbing the floor. That's not the type of person I am. Up at Bible camp, there are all sorts of jobs. I, I look forward to going up there, and I find myself doing all sorts of jobs at Bible camp. I, I become uh, a preacher and Bible class teacher, of course. I have been a cabin leader many times. I have... Uh, I have been lifeguard, I've been in charge of the skit show, I've even been co-director uh, co on certain occasions. So I found myself doing many types of jobs, but you know what job I've never done? I've never been on KP, they call it, kitchen patrol, where you either cook the meals or you clean the kitchen or you do all of it and you clean the cafeteria. You know, I've been pulled into some of that before where I have to wash the tables or sweep the floor, and even that much was always uh, annoying to me. I, I find myself doing the more dignified jobs. 
so to speak. I, I do the jobs that get all the glory. I do the jobs that put me in front of people. I don't want to put on an apron, roll up my sleeves, put a bandana on my head, and, and know that I'm going to sweat it out. You know, I've seen those on ki Kitchen Patrol do it. I've watched them, and I've always been way, somehow able to dodge those jobs. And so, consider this a confession this morning. I really struggle with a true servant-like mindset. So let's go ahead and look at the book of Philippians. Book of Philippians. I was reading through it, and it really felt like I was getting slapped in the face. Uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians is a beautiful letter. This is one of the prison epistles, which means Paul is in prison writing. And uh, he's writing to update different churches on their condition, uh, on his condition, excuse me. But more importantly, he's trying to deal with certain problems that the Philippian church was going through. And we find out in chapter 4, verse 2, that there was some kind of feud going on in the Philippian church. There were uh, a couple of women, it seems, who were fighting each other to the point that it became public in the church. And so Paul has to call them out by name in chapter 4, verse 2. And we don't know exactly what was going on, but it's clear that Paul was concerned that the Philippian church wasn't going to be united. Their unity is his number one concern right now. And this leads, of course, to the main theme of the letter found in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Where it says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Notice how many times he says basically the same thing. He wants them to be of the same mind, and he repeats this kind of phrase, same love, full accord, one mind. He'll repeat it again in just a verse or two. This is the theme. He wants them to be united, and he says the only way to do that, well, we see it in verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If you like to highlight phrases, and I encourage that in your Bible, one of the phrases you want to highlight in Philippians is this phrase, same mind, one mind, same love, full accord. This idea is repeated. But if you're going to underline a key verse for this book, well, you don't have to look much further than verses 3 and 4. This is Paul's point. He wants them to stay united, and he says the only way you're going to stay united is if you selflessly consider others as more important than yourselves. Consider their interests before considering your own. And this is a very compelling idea. And Paul, throughout the book of Philippians, gives us several examples of this mindset, several examples of selflessness. And, and we don't have to uh, wonder what the greatest example of selflessness is. Of course, the greatest example of selflessness is Jesus, which he goes on to say. Verse 5, have this mind, there's the phrase again, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he didn't hold on to it. He was in heaven, with uh, one with God, one with the Trinity. He is God, of course. But he was willing to let go of his glory. He was willing to leave heaven, humbling himself. Verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God 
has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the, to the glory of God the Father. Notice the humility of Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of selfness, selflessness. He emptied himself. He came down and became man. He he emptied himself of that glory, didn't hold on to it, became a man like us. Think about that. These are perhaps, this is a part of Jesus we don't like to think about too much. When Jesus stubbed his toe, it hurt. Jesus got ill like we do. Jesus, he had to deal with these things that we have to deal with. God took that on because of his selflessness. We find out he did it all for us. But he, he went even further. He, wasn't just, he didn't just become man. He became a servant. He humbled himself to the point where he would wash his disciples' feet, which was something only servants did. Wherever he went, he served. He was born in a barn. Jesus became a servant. He humbled himself to that point, but he also humbled himself, as Paul says, even to the point of death. He was tortured. A whip raked across his back, and that could have killed him even before he was sent to the cross, where they pierced his hands and his feet, and he suffocated. This is what Jesus was willing to go through for you and for me. So, of course, Jesus is the greatest example of selflessness that we could find. But Paul doesn't stop there with Jesus. Oh, he could have. If, if the book of Philippians was only these 11 verses, it would still be a wonderful book. We'd still be studying it to this day. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives three other examples of selflessness. And I think there's a reason for that. I think it could have been tempting for the Philippian church to say, well, yeah, but that's Jesus. He's perfect. He's Jesus. He's God incarnate. Of course he's going to be selfless. I can't be like that. And so I think there would have been this temptation to use Jesus as an excuse. Where, oh, I can't be like Jesus, therefore I'm, I think I'm doing pretty good. Well, that's, I think, why Paul gives three other examples First of all, he gives himself as an example, and this isn't in a boastful way. I think it's through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he's able to do this. But it wasn't Paul's example that gave me that one-two punch. It was the other two examples that really hurt me. And it was while I was reading chapter 2, starting in verse 19. Let's read it together. This is what he says. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Now, because this is a personal part of the letter, Paul uh, is talking about maybe him leaving prison and sending Timothy. Because it's so personal, we might be tempted to keep reading and not pay too close attention. But I really think that would be a mistake, because he holds Timothy up as another great example of selflessness. Notice the words he uses. Timothy serves. Timothy has proven worth. He serves like a son to a father. We're also told that he was genuinely concerned for the Philippian church and their welfare. And I, I really love that phrase. And Paul, Paul compares him to other people. And I think really other Christians who aren't so genuinely concerned. To other people who aren't so selfless. He says, Timothy is not like other people. Timothy is concerned about the needs of Christ, not his own needs. And he says this, he's genuinely concerned. 
I read that phrase and I ask, what does that mean? Why would he, why would he add that word genuinely? And then I think of myself. And I ask myself, how many times have I been half-heartedly concerned? How many times have I been in the foyer and somebody from the, from the congregation comes up and talks to me and they have some kind of need or they have something going on in their lives and I'm half-heartedly interested? I told you I'd be confessing this morning. I'm stomping on my own toes. Hopefully you will have grace for me. But there have been times when I've got other things going on in my life. I've, I've got struggles and concerns and, and questions. Or maybe I'm just getting ready for the sermon and I'm trying to focus my mind on that. And so I'm distracted while someone is talking to me. Or maybe I am just tired. Or maybe I'm bored. There have been times when uh, I have this really bad habit of trying to be aware of all the conversations around me. I guess it's FOMO, fear of missing out. So I'll be paying attention to this conversation, but I'm also trying to listen in on this conversation and this conversation. And it's this really bad habit of mine because the person in front of me deserves my full attention. You see, this, this example of Timothy really hurt me because Timothy's a young preacher. And he was genuinely concerned. Genuinely concerned. And I think, well, I mean, that's how preachers ought to be. <laughs> and that's how any Christian ought to be. So it hurt me, but I kept reading, and then it got worse. Okay, verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He indeed was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am therefore, I, excuse me, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So let's set the scene. And this passage is also personal. We find out that Epaphroditus, who is our final example of selflessness, Epaphroditus was the one who carried the letter to Philippi, to the Philippian church. And that's because he was actually sent by the Philippian church to help Paul in the first place. So Paul is in prison. He needs help. It's not like prisons today in the United States where they're given three square meals a day. Paul has to be helped from the outside. And so the Philippian church, they send Epaphroditus to help Paul. He has some kind of aid, some kind of monetary uh, supplement or food or something like that. And in some way, this gift was insufficient. We're not sure exactly how. But in some way, this gift that Epaphroditus was bringing from the Philippian church, it just wasn't enough. And so what did Epaphroditus do? What do most of us do when we're giving a gift and we know it's not enough? Well, we say, well, this is all I can give you. When it's really not. <laughs> and that's what Epaphrodi Epaphroditus, we see that immediately he got to work. Epaphroditus knew it was insufficient. And so what did he do? He took on a job, it seems, or something like that, and worked so that he could help Paul to the full extent that Paul needed it. And he worked so hard, we find out, that he worked himself nearly to death. He got sick. And then we're told in verse 26 that what distressed him most when he was sick was not the fact that he nearly died, but was the fact that he knew his church was worried about him. This is, if this isn't an example of selflessness, I don't know what is. He was thinking about the well-being of his church on his deathbed. That's what he was concerned about. So I've got to tell you, if, if the example of Timothy was like a punch to my jaw, Epaphroditus is just a, a punch to the gut. You know why? Because I was sick last week. <laughs> Sometimes God taps us on the shoulder 
Sometimes he's very subtle. Sometimes he smacks us in the face because we really need to learn something. And that was me this week. Because I'm the type of guy who, when I get sick, I complain a lot. I don't want to do anything. I just want to sleep. I just want to drink liquids. I know a lot of you are sick right now, and so maybe this is reaching you as well. But just know I'm preaching to myself first and foremost. When I get sick, everyone's going to hear about it. When I get a hangnail, people are going to hear about it. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but only a little. I'm the type of guy who, when I get sick, I don't mind letting other people serve me. You can ask my wife. On second thought, please don't. Please don't ask my wife about that. That's just how I've always been. I, I, I get sick and I, I really, I, I just don't want to do anything. And I want to thank Richard for covering for me last week uh, because I got sick last week and he took on uh, the Sunday service. And so I'm, I go through that week, and then I come into this week, and I open up the Word of God, and I read the example of Epaphroditus, who worked himself sick nearly to the point of death because he cared about Paul, because he wanted Paul to be okay. That was what his chief concern was. And then when he did get sick and he nearly died, his other chief concern was his church family. If that's not an example of a servant, then there are no examples of servants. You see, I don't wear this apron very often, but right now it's weighing heavy on me. In fact, it is kind of constrictive. It's the, I don't know, it, it wraps around the neck and it kind of automatically makes me bend over as if I'm bowing. It's an interesting object lesson there. Lord, please give me the heart of a servant. In verse 29, Paul says we need to honor people like this, people like Epaphroditus. And our culture really does a bad job at this. The church, I think, has allowed that culture to influence who, who we honor, who we bring glory to. You see, in our culture, it's famous actors, it's celebrities, it's the rich, it's athletes. We don't always honor the people who keep society functioning, that the people who, if, if they were to disappear, we suddenly wouldn't have a society. We don't really honor those types of people the way we ought to. And I think the church kind of falls into the same problem. Not exactly, but we definitely are uh, tempted to do so. I think of Richard and myself. We stand before a congregation on a regular basis. In many ways, we kind of become the face of the congregation. Think about how scary that is, Richard. <laughs> that uh, of all, if everyone's a part of the body of Christ, we're the face. Oh, that's not good, is it? Uh, but anyway, we, we all have different parts to play. And hopefully, I pray that Richard and I help people. Uh, in bringing messages from the Word of God. But the simple truth is that this is the type of job that gets you recognition in a way that some jobs don't get recognition. And they should. I think of the ladies' committee and all the work they have to do to get a meal uh, on our tables. And, and it, a lot of it goes un praised. And then the cleaning up afterwards. And guess who's not usually there much, uh, very late cleaning the tables. Uh, that would be uh, this guy. And uh, I, think of, I think of Earl. Uh, I think of so many servants in our church who do the little things, who make things work and, and function. I think of so many people. And then I think outside the church and I think of my mom. My mom, who uh, was a, has always been a wonderful servant to me and my family, and uh, as we were growing up, we weren't always grateful. And my mom is also a servant to the church. I, I just want to tell you a quick story about that. We, we were involved in a program called Lads to Leaders. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's this program that helps young uh, boys and girls 
uh, to kind of train themselves in certain leadership qualities for the church, especially uh, boys when it comes to preaching and Bible reading and things like that, that of course every congregation needs. And uh, we would go to these programs and it was a wonderful time. And it really is, it's the first, it's the thing that got me into preaching in the first place. We would go and I'd give a speech and it would be, you know, six minutes or so. And it would be a competition. And if we won, we'd get a trophy. Sometimes we'd even get a trophy for being a finalist. And, you know, I have a box of trophies. I really do. Uh, we got such glory, such praise. We, we would go to the front of a, of a, on stage in front of thousands of people. And we'd stand there, three of us. And they'd say, third place, this guy. Second place, this guy. And then you know you had won. And you, you're so excited. It was some great memories of my life. I think about my mom, though. My mom was the worker behind the scenes for Last Leaders. What she would do for our church was she would keep track of all the names. She would sign us up for the different programs. She would send, uh, she would actually make sure that we had hotel rooms, and she was the organizer. And I know, I saw that it took hours of work. Well, she continued this job even after my brothers and I uh, grew up and moved away. She continued this job for the young people of the church. And when she finally retired from it, uh, I think the, people, uh, the church was, was wondering, what are, who are we going to do to do this job? Uh, and what they did was, they, I was very pleased to see this, that they honored her with a plaque. And they clapped for her, and it was wonderful. And I was very glad that that happened. And I know that that plaque means so much more than any one of my trophies but I just can't help but notice a difference in the fact that I have boxes of trophies from last leaders and she has one plaque because there are certain jobs that just tend to get more glory and more recognition. And Paul says we need to honor men like Epaphroditus. We need to honor our servants. And so I want to encourage us to honor our servants, but I also want to encourage anyone who might be like me, who struggles to be a servant, struggles to put on the apron, roll up the sleeves, and just say, you know what, I'm going to do the work until it's done, and I'm going to have sweat pouring down my face. Whatever that job is, whatever that service is, if you're like me and you struggle being a, with being a servant, I, I hope that this has encouraged you. And so I'm going to end by asking you a question. What does your apron look like? Is it immaculate like mine? Which implies something about myself? Or is it covered in grime? Or maybe you've gone through multiple aprons because of how much a servant you are. Do you have the heart of a servant? Let's pray. Dear Lord, please give us the hearts of service. Please root out the selfishness in our hearts and transform us into the image of your Son. Lord, please help us to, to follow the examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus and be genuinely concerned for everyone around us, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, help us to be so servant-like, so service-oriented, that when we see that someone is being helped insufficiently, we do everything we can to fill the gap, even if it means working hard. Lord, please give us these hearts. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Let's sing a song together. Let's go ahead and sing, Make Me a Servant.